Uh, hello everyone, wherever you're watching us from, uh, welcome to Black Mental Health Matters. Uh, my name is Glenda Sasra and uh, I'm here right here in Uganda. Uh, today I have uh, visitors, so we call them guests. Uh, we are going to be talking, uh, talking about albinism and its impacts on mental health. Um, today, uh, one of my guests really struggling to get into the studios, but uh, gladly I have one of them. I have uh, Doreen. Doreen Nawaje here, and uh, maybe she's going to introduce herself so we can go on with the show. Uh, Doreen, can you introduce yourself to the people watching us? Okay. Uh, hello, dear viewers. This is Nawaje Doreen, my manager, uh, CEO of Benzim Crisis Outreach, and Executive Director of Women and Children with Albinism in Uganda. Uh, okay, uh, thank you so much, Doreen, for coming through today. Uh, we are glad you're here to take us through about this topic. Uh, of course, so many people have had issues. Uh, they don't know much about albinism. I don't know, personally, I don't know. Is albinism a disease, a condition? What is it? And does it have types? Uh, for example, if I say Claire has, has albinism. Is that a, a type B type C? What is albinism in short? Please explain to us what that means. All right. Albinism is uh, a condition, um, a skin disorder, basically, uh, a disorder that affects the skin, whereby it fails, okay, to make it all more Albinism occurs in both, in all living things, plants and animals. Okay. In plant animals, all living things, okay. mm. even in human beings. It okay. affects the eyes, the skin color, plus the hair. It's mm. a condition that is hereditary. It's passed on. Yeah, okay. it's inherited from. Mm. Uh, genes in the family. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, so, Darren, there are so many myths that are surrounding albinism. Uh, for example, here in Uganda, people especially, believe, yes, in, especially in Africa, but here in Uganda specifically, uh, people believe that people with uh, with the albinism condition are maybe a source of medicine to some diseases and all this and all that. How has that affected you mentally as people living with a condition? How do you relate with the people around you? How do you relate with the surroundings? All right. This kind of beliefs in a way, um, that's culture. We know very well the strength of culture, roots of culture. But probably here in Africa, being that uh, albinism, we do have the white color, and uh, it's a, a continent of black people. You find that these people find the person with albinism very strange, especially when you come out, if you're brought forth by both parents, when they are normal, as it is related. Like myself, both of my parents are normal. They were normal. Um, dad passed on, but his mom is still around, but they were both black, as I should say. And here I am, I come up with what? With albinism. So fortunately, what really, it's all about ignorance. But if you are happen to be, your parents happen to be educated, knowledgeable about the condition, they can accept you. But to me, when I try to do some bit of research and when I try to relate, kind of like when you try to convert with the people around, on one side, it's on the positive on the on the positive effect. Someone having albinism, because some people take us like goods or what they say, because they really can't believe they believe in a kind of like certain powers. Why you happen to be like that when both your parents don't have what albinism, and then the others look at it as uh, an omen, a curse. In most cases, some of them believe that uh, probably the parents are. Uh, there are certain iniquities in your background and uh, the offspring are truly paying for it, especially the parents of children with albinism, especially the mothers. 
they are the ones who normally face it so much, bringing out the discrimination, the stigma, they are chased out of families, especially from the husband's side or the men's side. They normally say, we don't bring, we don't bring forth for children. You take the child where she or he belongs, in most cases. So mm. those are kind of like the myth. It's hard, but what I normally say, the moment your parents accept you, if you have love at home, you can already have where it comes back. If they are just near, maybe at school or in the roadway moving, because it's normally called the people always come with the best. When you know that you have somewhere to go and you're welcome, I think you brush those ones because you forget. Yeah. So how has all that, that you've talked about affected you mentally? Uh, let me assume uh, you've gone to schools. How have the colleagues at school treated you? Uh, you go to restaurants and people see you. Uh, you probably use taxis. How do people see every time you try to, go to connect with people? How do they receive you? Well, uh, as I've said, of course, the negative bit of it can't fail to be there. People say anything. Probably even some of them think that we have our own language. We don't speak any of the native languages. Because some maybe don't think that we can speak Uganda or we can hear English or we, you know. So some people can ill talk about you just in your face. Even at times, because one time I remember I was in a restaurant in Kampala and uh, we're sharing, not that uh, they discriminated me or what. We are seated uh, on a table, and then the guys started talking openly to each other that, ah, if if this one happens to go to Tanzania, that is a good deal. It's real money. And I was there until I interacted in the conversation. I told them that you dare. And they kind of like, they said, hey, Adam, sorry. You know, Uganda, kind of like I thought now, you just can't be so mean like that, thinking that someone, you know, and you start uh, talking about them like that. So, it affects, at times, they see anything you get. So, even in the road or at times in the taxis, they can't see anything. But then at school, that's what I've been saying that if you know that uh, where you're bouncing back, everything is okay. No, man, there is no problem. Fortunately, I landed in uh, in hands of parents that were educated and they had uh, authority. Uh, so my mother, who was so key in this, she was already sensitizing uh, it's schools where I used to attend. She could tell them about our condition, how we are low, we are low vision, what is needed about us. And in most cases, the children are always very receptive. They don't know anything. For them, probably they are seeing something, someone strange. And you know kids, the attitude of kids, it's normally the adult. Maybe at times it's the parents who can tell their children that, ah, that is uh, maybe a woman with problems. Maybe you don't play with her, kind of like thinking that maybe it's contagious, maybe it's a contagious condition and the like. And maybe even some teachers probably of course, they can have their own ingratitudes, you get, or their thinking, their negative thinking towards children with what? With albinism. And you find some are not interested. As I've told you that we have a problem of low vision. So you find that some teachers, maybe they don't have that time. Because when you have a child with albinism in your class, a people with albinism, you have to go an extra mile. Because, like, I'm low vision. The pace at which you're writing, if you're writing notes on the blackboard, is not the pace I'll use while the other ones with normal sight when they're taking their notes. You have either to wait for me, maybe if it's dictation, then that's very fine. If not, if you are like uh, a teacher of mathematics or physics, whereby you have to illustrate with various formulas. I feel like I have to come back to you for something that I, uh, I missed out. Those maybe I couldn't see very well, but when you've already rubbed, rubbed off the blackboard, some could accept, they would be interested, but then others would say, uh, uh, no, 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 no. When they are not ready eh, to go that extra mile. So you find, but then that's it, those are people. And uh, unless you're persistent or when you have understanding parents, 
that's why eventually we find some drop out of school because nobody's ready to tolerate them or at times the parents are poor because for me i remember my mom just kind of like give i'll not call them tokens she used to pay something for a teacher so that he can go an extra mile with you yeah that's it okay so how did this one affect you academically because apparently some are not uh, are not uh, welcoming to you others are welcoming to you so how did it affect you in the long run no. as you went along with education exactly now i'll talk about uh, my secondary life basically i remember when i was joining senior one much as i'd passed very well with the first grade the school i'll not mention it which i wanted to join uh kind of like a condition we still had to do interviews to really see that uh we are that very kind of like maybe level or grades they wanted on doing the interview it was a single school girls school actually i came out the best so when we went back i was on the list of the people who had performed better but we realized later that it's the deputy who was around the headmistress wasn't around so we're given everything for admission and we went just like you're taking your child eh, to begin secondary we have done with each and everything and on reaching it's the headmistress who was there and she was giving all sorts of excuses she was saying yeah the girl is bright but then we can't admit her in the school she was giving all excuses that for them they do these other co-curricular activities they have to go for gardening and the like i think i was telling her that story can do the same so long as she's protected, if she's putting on her long sleeve clothes, if she's putting on a hat, all is well. But she made sure that we don't have an ambulance. Uh, transport from here, it's quite far. She completely even made sure we had paid money in the bank, but she made sure that she, she refunds our money there and then. She made sure that she refunds there and she gives us a refund so that I could then find another school. Uh, now i went to another school where the headmistress was receptive now when it came to my academics when it came to practicals especially chemistry going to the laboratory i was bright with regular things but then this thing of low vision came in how most of these things the equipment in chemistry as you know the directs the pipette they are glass and then they are labeled with white so it was always very hard for me then you find yourself you have to stand on the labs too so that you can read the digits or on the what on the direct to write your results it was taking long and uh, kind of like the teacher was not ready for that it affected me because like uh, he used quite some rude words that were not good for me of course psychologically i was affected I felt like not even I, I cried of course and I felt like no why should I go and attend uh, chemistry after all I'm not going to be doing practice but yeah it somehow affected me but the rest mm -mm, that wasn't an issue I thank God that uh, the rest I was doing very very well but still I did chemistry and I did well maybe I would have done better than that because I think I got uh, a credit for if it wasn't for that, maybe I would have gotten a distinction for my mm. So uh, after passing through all that, uh, I understand yeah. that there are so many children uh, around Africa, around Uganda, who have the condition. How yes. are you Are you making sure they do not pass through the exact same thing that you pass through while still at school? So they stay oh. mentally upright. Mm, true. The truth is uh, we are trying as hard to do sensitization. But I'll let you know that uh, <laughs> the albinism has just, by the way, come on board to be recognized uh, maybe by these other organizations that look at people with special needs or disabilities. We are the newest on board, I think, to be considered as people with uh, a disability or with a special need. And now you find that, um, of course, it's not easy. It's so gradual. It's gradual. We try to sensitize. And another thing, the problem is, is that uh, the parents themselves also 
they hide because of the stigma, they hide the children. And those in schools, by the way, I just wonder, of recent, this week, uh, this week, I think that was on Tuesday, there is a child who has been in our care and you wondered because they changed the school recently. They just changed the school. She's been attending a certain school. Now they changed for her schools, maybe because of this, uh, whatever change it came about. But then we found this guy is going to be affected. She's a very playful girl. She's bright. But just because uh, another headmistress went to visit this one who had accepted this girl, who had accepted this girl in her school, and told her that child must sit alone on the table, she should not on the desk, she should not play. Kind of they were discriminating and isolating her, thinking that they are protecting her. But then already this thing was affecting her. Then someone who came, uh, who went there as a representative, because we had taken hearts and protection frames, tried to display some videos of the children we have. The way they play, the way they play, Anything they do, anything, all these African games like cooking, just as you know, kids, you know, play whatever. We told her that this is what they do, and even doing some work like cleaning the house, washing for themselves, cleaning the compound, so long as they are protected, as long as you know what to do, how to go about it. And she was wondering, she was saying, Oh my god, this one was misleading me then. Okay, so now that's it, what I went through. Many have been rejected in schools. I have an experience of uh, <laughs> the myth going around that we emit light in darkness, such things. Because uh, there is uh, a family where there are four of them who've really suffered with the children because they were rejected by the dad, they are destitute, the, the mother was chased with her children. But now we got uh, a good well wisher who was paying for them school fees. Most schools they had rejected them, except in certain day schools. But then we need them to be in boarding school because they had uh, they are survivors. They had been kidnapped and they were just dropped uh, at a certain uh, on our border. So we had just rescued them. So wanted them to be in boarding school, but then openly, the administration requested begged us to take them two weeks prior to the opening of the school. Reason, they wanted to get acquainted to our ways. The matron herself approached me and said, but madam, I told her that for me, I was in boarding school. She says, yeah, you're grown up, I can see. I told her I was in a boarding school. Of course, myth used to be there, like when lights used to go off. All other students could run in our cubicle to see whether Doreen is truly emitting light, like this um, kind of like uh, those statues eh, that are fluorescent, which could emit light. They had that belief that even Doreen in their room, eh, she, you can see her. When light go, lights go off, you can press her in her room. So like the matron was saying that uh, you have to sleep here for like three days and we confirm that uh, these children don't want, don't emit light. So that by the time the school opens, these other ones come when there isn't anything to do what? To disturb them. And those are the kind of experiences, but uh, we keep on sensitizing. But still, those ones being there, because now, like, ah, they came to like them so much, they're hardworking, they are lively, you know, because uh, they were accepted after breaking kind of like those beliefs eh, surrounding such myth. Now, we have one we're dealing with, we're handling, who was psychological effect he was a very very intelligent man in school but uh, when he reached his senior three he was bullied and since when i should say he went off eh? he could not accept himself maybe whatever i don't know how i can explain it but uh we've been handling this case He's so much reserved his own to himself. He refused to go back to school. And even he reached uh, an extent of going to sit by the roadside. Was so desperate. He had spent like, by the time for us, we went in when they kind of approached us as albinism crisis outreach because uh, he's a he and an adult. So he had to go in that line. 
we're handling him, but he's coming back because he knew now that there are people who love him, who accept him. The care he's given, now even he can bathe, he can brush, he watches news, he really understands, but he just thought that everybody does not like him. That's what he thought, maybe. But it, when the mother narrates, it started from school. It started from, he was bullied at school. And that's what happened. And so uh, talking about bullying, all that brings stigmatization according to how you have brought it up. Uh, that is stigmatization. People, people uh, yes. with your condition are getting stigmatized in uh, different places, let us say at school, markets, churches, everywhere. everywhere. You mm -hmm. as the Albinism Crisis Outreach, what yes. are you doing to ensure that, that uh, these people do not face the kind of stigmatization that you have passed through or someone else who is like has passed through? Now, we've really gone in as even, uh, women and children with albinism because uh, with women and children with albinism, we don't only look at the women with albinism or children, but we look at children of being brought forth by women with albinism because you also they are stigmatized the moment they find out that these are children and their mother has albinism, like these young ones at school. They ask them certain questions. You find that even teachers, by the way, they ask them, hey, you mean that is your mom? Does your dad also look like that? They ask them awkward questions. So kind of like we've tried to reach out. We've got to school, we sensitize them. We've brought forth their moms around kind of giving them esteem to tell them that you have to stand out you get then the children now the students what we are trying to do because by the way they do approach us yeah they do reach out to us normally we get calls even uh there are certain hospitals whereby we've put representatives or agents like the midwives and so they normally tell us that ah there is a young couple here they've got or normally they say hey we've got one of you this morning now those are calls from hospitals information from hospitals so what we do is we go immediately to make sure that uh we encourage the parents we find that some young couples reject the children you find some of them love their children, but then the parents, especially uh, the boys' parents, normally they say, no, 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 let the woman go away. We have rescued uh, several of them, especially from the islands. We do have them. We try to do sensitization. And others we've not kind of like brought to be with us. We make sure that we go there often in case uh, there is anything, maybe we make sure we organize maybe like a birthday, if there is a baptism, we make sure that we go. And then these other people around also see that, oh, these people also have people of their kind who care for them. And normally we use such places as platforms of sensitization, like in case there is one being baptized, we go and that function, even at church, then we talk to every food around, maybe the place, the people who have gathered around. If it is a birthday, still we go, we attend. We normally use such. It's big barrier. If anyone of us maybe loses a parent, we make sure that we go as a team because that's where we find masses who wouldn't maybe reach. We go there, we try to sustain them. We like and even in schools, the moment we know that we have our own in a particular place, we reach out there. And knowing that uh, what I went through, I have no vision. And by then, affirmative action was not yet in place. And even now, uh, there are these, uh, we call them special education lessons, something a group of people dealing with the children with special needs and education. Now, after identifying that uh, we have low vision, that's it with albinism. So if you find uh, a student like in her own level or HSC, you try to find out the combination, you have to go, it's a process, then you have to go to your name, the register, so that his booklet or her booklet, they come up 
when they are in a special kind of like the prints are bigger because by the time we'll fit it to read as because of course already they were giving some more extra minutes for people those who are uh low vision and even pattern but now they come when they are printed but the problem is or the challenge not a problem all these things need money to find out to connect with that because you can't just wake up and you start asking all schools but what we do we make sure that uh when we get like a platform like this we say this is what we do so it's normally the head teachers who contact us that way we have one of your kind in our school what is needed in most cases they want sunscreen protection or they want shed they want part of the life then we proceed from there and we do that especially the candidate it's been a productive exercise because and i think now i think we have like uh six great ones this year who are a product of that exercise right from all level yeah we followed them up hsc uh university and now here we are if uh, thank you. Are also started. Mm. okay thank you so much doreen uh, talk, uh, talking, talking about sensitization you are saying mm. that uh when you get information to have one of you in the standard school i'm going to I'm, I understand it as if you understand there is someone who has a, an albinism condition in some school, you go along to follow them up so that they can maintain their academic status. Now I'm thinking about it in this way. Have you done uh, this kind of outreach? Let me say um, you go to schools, even if there's no one with an albinism condition, and then you try to stay in case, in case we don't have a future policy, in case that school receives someone. So they are aware of what to do without you even going back to tell them do this, do that, do the other. Have you done that before? Come again. Uh, like you talked about sensitization, right? Yes. Mm. And you say that uh, when you get information that you have uh, a child living with albinism and uh, joining a STEM school, you as the crisis, uh, as a crisis research program, you always go there to to ensure that child has a good life in that school yes so, so i'm thinking about it this way do you yeah. like do you do this kind of sensitization where you have to go to schools even if they do not have someone with uh living with albinism in that school do you always reach out to them in case they get someone with albinism in that school so that they know how to handle them without you having to go back to teach them all this kind of stuff fortunately Apart from being, uh, apart from dealing with programs concerning albinism, there are certain other activities. I've told you that uh, any gathering, we use it as a platform to sensitize. Especially, it starts with myself because, like, wherever you go, even if it's not something concerning, or if it's a school, because uh, not necessarily because uh, I have other things I do. Sorry, yeah? because uh, I'm a video addict. I do so many things, and uh, wherever I've been teaching or I've always been getting a chance to teach, these are schools without what. I've never kind of like uh, taught in a school where there are children with albinism, surprisingly. But then here I am, I have albinism. I've always been using my position to talk to the students themselves. And even of course, the fellow staff, they so much want to ask about you and you sensitize them. For instance, uh, if it's an uh, outing where you have, where you have to interact there is nowhere I live without talking about this condition. To sensitize, even if it's a wedding, hmm? I mean, to events, even if it's a wedding, if I get a chance, I have to talk about that condition. And encouraging others, because I have a feeling that I'm a role model. So when I'm talking, if I happen to get a chance of talking, I encourage others. I tell them that, you know what? you realize when it's too late in case you have any child there, even if it's your relative, or you just see a child in your neighborhood or just passing, 
we tell them that everything is possible. We go to school also, and we can do so much. As I've told you, in the event, so I tell them that I sit, the person responsible for where you sit and everything, whether back the cake, whatever. I tell them this is the person who works with our business. And many others can do even much more than they can, you get, if they're given a chance. So that's what we do. Even if it's a wedding, even if I've not been in charge of it, but if I happen to get a, a chance, I have to talk about the condition. Sensitization is done everywhere. Even I go to the police, by the way, I go to the police. Anywhere I find myself, I find a way of sensitizing. Even if it's in the taxi, all these border border guys jokingly in a friendly way yeah you start up even if it's in the market because of course these are people who are eager want to hear what you say so yeah you bring in your issue you bring in your issue. uh doreen uh one of our viewers uh dr Masha harris is asking uh what kind of learning challenges or physical problems experienced by children living with albinism in schools and how are these addressed okay. i'm quite sorry huh? um i said one of our viewers is asking mm. what kind of learning challenges or physical problems are experienced by children with albinism in the schools and how are these what addressed kind of learning? Are what kind of learning challenges or physical problems oh. are children living with, are children living with albinism facing in schools and how are these challenges being addressed? All right. The challenges we normally get, low vision, whereby you need to sit very close to the blackboard or to the teaching aids. And you find that uh, in some schools, when they have their own sitting arrangements, they may not need to do what? to tamper with them just because of your condition. You could find that uh, you are tall in your class, you're tall than some other, and it is intended that it's meant that normally tall people sit at the back of the class. And then these ones who are short, they have to sit at the front. But then in the back, I'll not be able to see. I want to sit close. I want to sit at the front desk. And the time you have to negotiate a lot or else, that's why some of them drop out of school because they can be chased. Another thing are the school uniforms. We have to put on long sleeved clothes to protect us from the, uh, the sun rays because they cause, because of the ultraviolet or whatever rays, they cause skin cancer. So we get skin cancer just because we don't have the other protecting pigment, the melanin. So you find that. Some schools, they put on short-sleeved shirts or even shorts. And then they don't even allow additional things like a, a wide-brimmed hat. And for them, they can think maybe it's a luxury. And at times, the sunscreen protection we put on, some of them do have some bit of tint. Eh? Uh, they can have some bit of color. And then they can think it's makeup. Hmm? I also used to find such challenges. You find that uh, where your dormitory is, that was in HSC, is the distance to where the library is or the your classroom bro, classroom block is. You have to put on a hat. But then again, along the way, between your dormitory and class, you are arrested by the senior woman in metro. Then you have to go and face the disciplinary committee in the staff room. But then uh, it was, all, as I told you, that it needs when your parents are also vigilant. And at times I could be expelled. <laughs> over, no, not expelled, but suspended. You have to go home for two weeks or so what you write, uh, they write a letter to your parent that uh, you are disobedient or you whatever the school uniform kind of like that then you have to come and explain with that i was always i used to do it with confidence even if they would write i knew i would go and tell them you know what because i was putting on hat because i was putting on a long sleeved shirt and the uniform is short sleeves so she could understand so those are some of the challenges in most schools at times they don't accept 
or even working like as i've told you of course with corporate activities we are also supposed to participate because i remember i was also an athlete i'm a woman also who does gardening but when i'm protected i know how to do it i know what appropriate time that is appropriate or the proper time for me to do it that it won't affect so those are some of the challenges uh, you find some of the things that do favor us again are not uh, accepted on the school programs yeah so uh if you find those things not accepted in the school programs you as the albinism community because I believe you had people who knew about your condition and they were backing you up, support you. What did they do? Or oh, what you, you as you, did, what did you do to ensure that you you live just the same way your fellows live in the same school so that you enjoy all the rights that school gives? Um, come again. You, of course, uh, if such challenges, uh, we get such cases or reports. We are, we are always trying to get uh, air time. We try as much to sensitize. And then another thing, because there are various uh, programs at times uh, or workshops or seminars, which we do attend, not necessarily concerning persons with albinism only, but uh, when they are collective of all, concerning all, all people with special needs. So you find that uh, for us, for me, according to the experience and sensitization, I have a feeling, just like when the lawyers come out of university and then they have to join LDC, kind of like uh, to be maybe, I don't know, ground more into their field of advocacy. I have a feeling teachers and basically those two must, I have a feeling they should design a simple course concerning albinism that's what i feel even if it's a, a one week's course but it has to be there or maybe concerning all special needs there should be a course explaining or talking about and caring of all types of special needs albinism inclusive hmm. okay i'm talking of a course i'm going to try to address this issue to the education ministry to the ministry of gender have you tried to do that so they get to know about it and then they can put it into their that's plan. what i said eh? uh these uh, ministries we've written to all the expected concerned bodies eh? we've tried to write and uh through our national union of persons with disabilities that's where we find all the different interest groups or different yeah of, of various special needs this is where we have of course we have all representatives of all types of disabilities and all whatever concerns us is found there and even ministry of gender i've told you we're just coming on board everything is gradual but uh, we are not where we started, but we are not yet where we want to be. But we are trying to push it. So uh, in a situation where, where a child is, is in school, and they are facing this kind of stigmatization, they are maybe first idea when you are stigmatized, you will not be able to learn very well in school. Some issues are going to affect you mentally, others are going to affect you physically, others are going to affect you in so many other ways. How are you ensure was there are people who are living with that condition, but they have confidence. No matter what someone says, they will still be like, I am me, I can do it. I do not think I would be like this, but it happened. But are those who get stigmatized to an extent that they feel like committing suicide? What yeah, have you true. done about that? Yeah, what have you done about that to ensure that these ones come back on track with the rest? The truth is, those we've managed to reach because as i've told you we are also kind of hard to reach population eh? the cases we managed to access because i'll not say we've tried because you can't hear of a case and you leave it we've had several we've had several cases whereby a parent tries suicide because she has brought forth 
children with albinism and when especially when it comes to when she has been disowned or rejected by the husband's side and then she's thought to go with her children we've had several cases of such but we try to encourage them now like uh, where we are at our premises at women and children with albinism though we are still small but all the women we have there it be the very women with albinism or the mothers of children with albinism we've tried to encourage them by the way according because we also did our internal research as we are reaching out through albinism crisis outreach we go to different districts because women and children with albinism is in it's a CBO, but in Uganda, we have representatives in all regions of Uganda. Now, when we used to make these reach outs and we still do make them, the research I did, uh, we based on a certain lady, uh, she's in Kayunga district, but I'll not say her names. We found out she has seven children. All of them are normal, they don't have albinism, but each child with its own dad, and now this is a woman who is so needy. Hmm? She had all these children, but she cannot even feed them. Then I asked her that, why is it that, yeah, I, I told her that, well, it's good. We thank God that you've got children. They are gifts from God. But at least, why did you have at least two or three? Eh? Then she told me that it wasn't my intention, not even, my intention not even to have two children or three. But the first man who came of course most of them become uh, based on the rituals and the beliefs that sexual intercourse with one of us that is a should royal you get but then you find that uh, this lady she explained and said that uh, the first baby she had nothing completely she's not educated she has no land, she hasn't got anything. She thought that maybe the man was her hope in life, eh? was a ray of hope. Didn't know that he had his other intentions. When she conceived, he disappeared. He could not even trace his whereabouts. Now another one came because she was looking for what to do to feed this baby. Because of, she was poorly feeding, she didn't have breast milk. Whatever, and even other needs the baby would need. This is the baby who was malnourished. Then this other good one comes of course like when she was at crossroads she made a decision hoping that another ray of hope had come towards uh towards her way but then this is another guy who made her pregnant and also disappeared and that's how the thing happened it it became recurring you get she told me that if the first one promised me to thousand the other one promised me 4,000. And another one promised me maybe even 10,000. Okay? So that's how things ended up. So she happened to be with seven children, but from a different time. So then we found out that it's because these women are lacking. Not just some of them. Most of them were denied. They never went to school. But you talk to, we talk to them. We tell them that this is not the end of the world. There are certain skills they can learn. Or even some of them, they are so desperate in that condition, feeling like committing suicide. She has a feeling that maybe even when she brought food, people will not buy. That's why for us, our motto is changing the image, but it has to start with us. One thing, packaging and accepting that I have albinism, but life has to go on. I don't need to die. Why should I commit suicide just because I have albinism? No, I just have to make sure that I'm positive and I have to attract other people to come my way, eh? you get? What am I doing? That's why we realized after our research, we realized that economic empowerment is very, very important. Some of these women were having, they could access land eh? wherever in the villages they were. You tell them, at least you grow the food. Even if you don't sell it, at least you eat it. Because again, hmm, you are being stigmatized, but again, even you are starving when you can grow your own food, you grow it and eat it. And others, hmm, it depends. Also, your attitude matters. If you don't give chance to, huh, what can I say? Some things you just have to keep a deaf ear. Because uh, even if uh, you accept, why do you accept a situation kind of like to live for you? Why do you allow these other people to dictate in your life? That's something I used to, I never used to give chance. 
And by the way, we really changed the image because the women we have, oh my God, we are doing a lot. Eh? We started the uh, economic empowering projects, different ones, uh, activities rather, but the project is called Mama Mzum, whereby women, we are producing soap because we say now, those beliefs that uh, people may fear to eat, maybe because like uh, certain jobs, there is one who had started uh, washing for people clothes and she's doing, she was doing it very well. Now one neighbor, a working neighbor, a male, asked those people around that, hey, your people who start around, who washes for you? He, it, they said, oh, there is a lady, she does it very well. She's punctual, she's fast and even she does the laundry very well. So he said, please, can you bring me that lady? It was in the morning before this guy left for work. On seeing that the lady they had brought had albinism, he said, I'm lucky that I've seen, because I was just going to leave my clothes and money. But if I found out that it's a woman with albinism, I would have burnt all the clothes. You get that? So she called me, because like it's me who had kind of like put her into that uh, business and even given her some of the contacts for the people she could wash for. She called and said, I'm afraid. She was fearing now, thinking that maybe even these other people are going to reject her. I told her, no, 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 you just go on, leave that one. That one's not for you. So it's us. Certain things happen, but you know, you just keep that one and go on. You put it at your back and then you proceed. So those are some of the things. So now like, uh, and even being a kind of like as uh, household, some people may not accept that. Uh, you can't do my dishes, you can't cook for me. So we looked at businesses whereby everybody, they wouldn't mind. So we started with uh, soap making, natural soap making. We do weaving, we make crafts, baskets, and the like. Because now, like, uh, these people, the businesses, uh, the business has picked up. Hmm? And we are employing many women now, uh, not very many, because the business is growing. We started very few, but now, you know, it's expanding and, like, by the end of the year, maybe we would have added on some more women, but we get from different regions. We get from different regions. And now the women, now the way they style up, they do their hair, they buy good clothes, they send their children to school, most important. They are independent. They can rent their own houses and stay, you know. They're independent. They have a future because we are changing the image. It starts with us. We are impacting society. We are impacting society. They're not giving us, yes, they could be giving us out of sympathy, but not free because we are also delivering services, you get. That's all. Mm. Uh, okay, uh, Doreen, uh, mm. I was just thinking about this. In a situation where uh, a person living with albinism gets married, because apparently I saw your other name is Mayanja, so I would like to believe that you're married, right? Hello? Yeah, are you getting me? Yeah, I'm getting uh, you. Yes, uh, your other name is Mayanja, right? So I would like to believe that you are married, that you have children. Mayanja is my dad's name. Okay. Mm. It's my so, uh, dad's name. Okay, uh, okay. in a situation where uh, a, a person living with albinism gets married, uh, gives birth to children, and uh, upon these children grow, they realize their mother has, or their dad has a different color from the rest of the population. And these yes. children try like try to find out why are you like this? And even if you explain as much as you can, they shun you because at school they are probably getting stigmatized, probably their fellows are telling them, Do you know what? Your mother's like this and this I'm not associated with you, your dad is like this and this I'm not associated with you. How do you deal with that kind of situation? All right. Unfortunately, that, that's what I was talking about at first. That uh but then these are uh, the sensitization where we've been doing it where our children go because most of the women they have their children much as some of them are single but then even I have those who are married in the organization legally married as we said they are staying with their husbands and with their children of course this is something you cannot avoid because you find that at times even the very neighbors where you leave your children, just like the rest, or it can even be the very teachers, 
and they tell the children because like uh, we have cases when by whereby the children came back and said teacher so and so said that mommy you have albinism that uh, it's abc you get but then as i told you children are children they are they are very innocent they have very clean minds and souls they're polluted by adults that's the truth so this is something you cannot avoid because of course they have to talk because even the teachers themselves even uh health workers midwives you know okay some women even uh like uh that's something we handle it the way it comes i'll not say that we have a solution because it's not going to end there hmm? it's not going to end there it's not going to end yes you can handle you you tell each child whoever comes with a complaint is the one you talk to and even you tell the parents themselves just as we're also growing up and we ask the parents me i used to ask my parents why i look like this but then it was told to me by the kid from school they they are the ones who told me that for you you have albinism or they told me that you are an albino and at home they never told me such a thing so i went back and said them that i asked them what it meant you get except what i remember i used to throw tantrums at home yeah i used to throw tantrums at home that uh kind of like uh, telling them whenever i could get annoyed i tell them to take me back to my parents after all i don't look like you you know but that was being a child in a way yeah it was always used as an excuse but this is something you cannot avoid and you cannot prevent it. You get this is something you cannot cross a bridge before you reach it. It we handle it the way it comes. Just telling the children that you know what, don't mind them. But then what I realize, a mother is a mother. Even if you saw what children steal, they'll never kind of like feel small or what, because you're their mom. Mm because you're there, ma. That's if you also love your children, which is the uh, case. So, uh, so uh, thank you so much, Doreen. Uh, so uh, having passed through uh, all these experiences, uh, seeing children passing through the same things, uh, you as the albinism crisis outreach, mm. what are those sensitization? What are those other things you are you trying to do? To ensure that people living with albinism fit into our community, but ideally, even now, uh, the places where we come from, mm -hmm. I can uh, some people might meet an albino on the streets and they'll be like, no, 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 that person has a different skin color. And then there are also these myths of uh, people living with albinism having a cure for certain diseases, reason why they are kidnapped and maybe taken to certain places so that they can be Those used are the for myths. Certain so how do you deal with that besides the sensitization the education what are you doing exactly what are you doing on ground apart from sensitization then we also have to sensitize ourselves you get we have our own fellowships and talks we have the international albinism awareness day whereby we all meet we share challenges experiences and then uh, we compare notes eh? because you could find that uh an experience have gone through someone from the village has not gone through it because of the different environments you get so now like uh, first of all we have to know what our challenges are and the major threats hmm? we very well know that we are so prone to skin cancer because of the sun then we get to know how to look after ourselves but then when we still have to work another thing we know that we are endangered species so we have to be very alert sensitive because like someone who is meaning harm uh who is kind of like uh is to harm you of course we not come openly directly you just have to be alert eh? so then we get to know we just have to be alert that's what i should strategic yeah you just have to be strategic we learn some strategies like telling the children that uh mind the people who normally call you or to say hi like that so they just have to be vigilant alert 
and very sensitive. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's okay. it. Uh, Doreen, uh, we are coming to the close of the show. So I would, uh, I have one last question about service delivery. Uh, let Hello? me say when you get, uh, I have one last question about service delivery. Uh, but when you get sick, let me say you're going to hospitals or maybe you want a police to report a certain case or maybe uh, all these other services that we try to, that we receive from the public. How are you always perceived? Let me say, if you go to the hospital and you're in front of the line, are you always considered first uh, before the other, other person or are you always told, wait, I'll work on you later? How does the public perceive you as regards to service delivery? Well, my experience in hospitals, I think, uh, unless otherwise, it's not so much considered that uh, because you have albinism, maybe you're not being the queue and the like, except in certain places whereby where people now are getting to know that uh, our major threat is the sun. In most cases, it may not be necessarily a hospital, but these are the public places, for instance, where you need to line up like uh, this exercise we've just had, like the general elections, people knew and they had to deal with us uh, very fast, especially where there is the sun. They normally consider us probably even in the park at times when you're fighting for taxes, especially when they are those are kind of like rush hours and jam and fast road cars in the taxi parks. At times they consider, they say, hey, Bambi, uh, she doesn't, uh, she has poor vision. Maybe they even think that we have poor night vision as well. Then they will say that, Madam, come and sit. They get your seats. And, but then another thing or rather problem I've seen, the attitude, like some women used to hear, to fear to go for antenatal. But even the, med the medics themselves, like the midwives at times, eh? I'll not say they make fun of them, but kind of like the attitude they handle them with affect them, and you find that they no longer want to go. There is one who used to think that whenever she used to go to hospital, some of them would always ask each other, especially the one who was examined her. Then she would hear the other midwives asking that, "Were you able to see the baby?" They think that maybe our bodies are transparent, and so all transparent, you can see the baby from inside because our skins are. My own experience. Like, um, I had to be transfused one time, some time back, and uh, the nurses were fearing to prick, thinking that the skin will just tear, maybe like a mushroom. You get, and then I wonder, I said, No, if the health workers are like that, who know the very well the condition and the cause, if they again behave like this, we expect some of. Well, some of kind of like the, work, the scenarios, and except if I know the parent, uh, she was expecting, they didn't know they were, she was going to bring forth albinism. So at eight months, she got uh, an upstate and then she had to stay in hospital because uh, that was a very kind of like uh, delicate situation of her being an ex almost due mom, and then you get uh, an accident. Then she brought forth a baby with albinism. Yeah, they managed to get the baby when she was due, when the time had come. But because the child had albinism, the mother had not yet recovered from the accident effect. But they asked for kind of like to be discharged before time. Because before even the patients themselves were coming around eh, to see the baby you get. Even nurses, those who are not working the same word, eh, but could still in them. Uh, our first time to say baby with albinism, you get. So those are kind of like some of the, some just want to come and see eh, if they inject her, or the blood comes out with it without, you know, certain things, such things, such experiences, of which I can't say that uh, we're going to stop them because we can stop them, but maybe with time. It can't be abrupt. Everything is done gradually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Doreen, uh, for sharing those experiences and for sharing your story. It's really been a, it's really been a pleasure having you today. And maybe some other time you have to come around to take us, us, take us through about all these other things. Uh, to have you as we'd love to apologize for other for our other guests. There was a 
a network issue where he is, so he couldn't join us, but uh, we believe that next time is going to be so better. Uh, so, uh, Doreen, uh, thank you so much. We have to end our broadcast here, and uh, hopefully next time we shall have you for some more talk. Okay, thank you so much, Doreen, and uh, everyone else, wherever you are, have a good night. Thank you, Claire. Good afternoon. Thank <laughs> you.